welcome to the Rooted in Community podcast. My name is Dr. Ariel and I'm the host of the podcast. And with this podcast, we really hope to bring a sense of obviously community, but also give you the best evidence-based information regarding wellness, regarding your fitness and regarding performance as well. My name is Dr. Ariel and I am one of the co-owners of Rooted Physio and Performance. It is a mobile physical therapy and performance training company. I'm also a licensed physical therapist. I'm a experienced yoga instructor and I'm a postpartum and pregnancy exercise corrective specialist. So for today's episode, this is episode number one, I first wanted to just get into, you know, the question between what's the better path, holistic health, holistic medicine, or evidence-based practice and evidence-based medicine? And I really wanted to describe the difference between the two, but also why, you know, a this versus that approach is often not the answer to solving whatever you're dealing with. So I figured this would be an important place to start with this podcast, just because I am a physical therapist and physical therapy used to be actually considered alternative medicine. So physical therapy was started by actually a nurse who started helping, um, you know, patients in the hospital get moving again after injuries, after illnesses and after surgery. And it quickly started to become very researched and very evidence backed. And then, you know, Many, many, many years later, we're now considered, you know, inside of the medical system. When we think about holistic medicine, so first let's just kind of describe and define these terms. So holistic medicine, you might see like a lot of different messaging around this. Some people will say alternative medicine. Some people will say complementary medicine. Some people will say holistic practices or holistic therapies. And really, a lot of times in the research, you know, the semantics of it all doesn't, it kind of, it doesn't really stay consistent. So for today's episode and kind of what we'll be talking about is we're going to be defining the difference between alternative medicine and evidence-based practice or medicine. So alternative and complementary medicine or CAM approaches is often what we call things such as acupuncture, um, you know, naturopathic care, a lot of natural medicine where we're using herbal supplements instead of, you know, uh, pharmacological treatments such as medications. Also, you know, even like sauna bathing, um, dry brushing, if you've heard of that before. And of course, I am going to be talking about things today in the podcast that kind of go beyond the scope of me as a physical therapist. I'm not here to try to be your doctor. Um, Always discuss if you have any other further questions, you can leave them in the comments, but always discuss anything you're changing about your health or your plan with your actual medical doctor, not just with someone on a podcast. So if we think about alternative medicine kind of being more of the things that a lot of people look at as like woo treatments, um, we can think about evidence-based practice and its definition. So evidence-based practice or evidence-based medicine actually involves a really strong research backing. And that's often what gets put out there is, oh, there's evidence for this or there's research behind this treatment approach. But I think a lot of times people forget the other two limbs of evidence-based practice. So not only are we looking at research with evidence-based practice, but we're also looking at our patient or client and their cultural um, ideals and their beliefs. We also want to think about the actual clinician, the person who's practicing um, that medicine, what their experience is as well. So evidence-based practice is not just about research. It's also about how that research fits into the experience I have as a clinician and also how it fits into that person's cultural beliefs. So those, again, are definitions, um, like pretty much out of textbooks. But if we think about what the actual world and what happens in the actual world, nothing's really textbook in medicine. So why do people feel as though holistic healthcare is kind of becoming this new buzzword or becoming more popular? And a couple of these are going to be my own opinion, but a couple of these are really, again, driven by what we're seeing in um, the research. So probably the top reason why holistic healthcare is starting to rise is that people are just getting more information on the internet about it. 
So if we think about, you know, I'm 30 years old, my parents are in their 60s and 70s, and growing up, like, they didn't have the internet. They didn't have this access to all this information about different ways to treat illnesses. Instead, they went to their family doctor, if they were even going to a doctor, and they basically verbatim listened to every single word they said. So there's obviously like a big power dynamic there where you're just listening and believing and trusting somebody. And as a lot of us have experienced in our lives, especially if you come from, you know, a discriminated background, like I'm biracial, my father is black and Cherokee, my mother is Irish, neither, neither of them grew up with a lot of money. Um, and just from experiences from them telling me, but also, you know, even as the next generation, growing up in the suburbs, like there's definitely that lack of trust sometimes in medical providers, especially when you're from a community of color um, or dealing with, you know, an illness that might be a little bit more rare. So I think that brings me kind of to number two, why people are going more towards this holistic pathway or holistic way to medicine is because there is this lack of access to a lot of different care for a chronic illness. So if we think about chronic illness in this country, we can think about things like diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, but we can also think about things like low back pain because low back pain is probably one of the biggest disability factors in this country in America. And so as we kind of move throughout our lives and start to learn this information, we start to get a little bit more curious about what can help us. So that's kind of thinking about like, you know, why holistic healthcare is on the rise. I really believe it's those two main factors. We have more information out there for free on the internet that we're just seeing these words. But also if we think about, you know, communities that have not really been honored in the medical system, a lot of those communities are just not trusting the doctors and they're instead going to maybe someone in their community who might have some information and seeking sources from there. There's also a historical part of this as well, where back in the day, you know, even medical doctors used to do house visits and come to your house. And there was a lot more personalized compared to now what we call big box medicine. You know, if you look pretty much on any corner in any major town, there's probably like an urgent care, a pharmacy, and then some type of outpatient medical literal box um, building with multiple floors and multiple different services in it. And although that might increase access because we are again putting these, uh, putting these buildings a little bit closer to people, it is you know creating a little bit of an assembly line structure when it comes to you see your doctor maybe for 10 minutes, they, get, they write a script for something that you're dealing with and move on to the next. Again, I'm not here to blame any uh, primary care doctors or medical doctors, but that literally is the situation. Even as a physical therapist, before I started my own practice, I was dealing with that as well. So evidence-based practice is also on the rise. Again, if we think about that information I gave earlier about how, you know, back in the 50s or 60s, we used to just trust everything that came out of our doctor's mouth. Whether or not we knew if that was research-backed or if that pertained to their experience or if it really mattered in our cultural context. So evidence-based practice is now taught as the standard at any doctorate level or medical um, medical training as being pretty much the first thing you learn as soon as you get to school. There's definitely some positives about this. When we think about research, like research is very controlled, meaning if we're looking at a study where we're looking at the effects of an exercise program on low back pain, for example, they're gonna control for a lot of different variables that might affect the data. For example, they're going to control for the fact of what is that person's age? What is that person's weight? Um, what was their prior activity level? Because all those three things might actually affect the outcome of the research. So research is great in the sense that we are getting these huge studies being done and long term studies being done so that we're not only seeing the short term effects, but also the long term widespread effects of different treatments on certain conditions. It also does put us in a little bit of a box. Um, specifically speaking from my experience, like I would say I'm definitely um, evidence-based provider, 
But at the same time, I work with a lot of pregnant women and I don't know about you, but not a lot of people want to do research on pregnant ladies, right? A lot of times that's just like a big no-no in research. So you can start to see how evidence-based practice is not just about research, but it's also about experience. It's about clinical expertise, but also about the client's culture. When we think about kind of the holistic healthcare system and what a lot of people see as these more alternative practices, we're actually starting to see in the last 10, 20 years that a lot of these practices are getting put into the research and studied. Practices such, such as acupuncture, practices such as yoga. Um, I'm also a yoga instructor, so I definitely keep up on the literature there. And we're actually seeing a lot of positive effects at a minimal cost and a minimal barrier to entry. So if we think about some of those disparities I discussed earlier about, you know, definitely communities of color having worse access to healthcare, well, maybe holistic healthcare is answering that by saying, hey, instead of needing to go to a medical doctor and get an x-ray or MRI on your back, well, try these yoga postures that have been studied and see if that helps. Try that for a few weeks based on this protocol we created. If that doesn't work, then yeah, you might want to go to your doctor. So what are the risks involved with, you know, being one-sided of either accepting all the alternative practices or accepting just research as what you're going off of to treat a disorder? So again, we have to kind of come back to the definitions of being holistic versus being evidence-based. And I think now that things are being more researched on the alternative front, I think really we can start to embrace the fact that like, it's not this all or nothing approach or this, this or that approach. It's more so how can we be holistic and follow the evidence? So if we were just thinking about being holistic by itself, you know, a lot of people would not maybe comply with taking medications that are necessary. Um, or even if you've been working and doing, you know, a physical therapy practice for three months with a physical therapist and you're not getting better, you know, the next step would really be to seek out a little bit more advanced, um, you know, imaging or something else to see what's going on with you. A lot of times people are more resistant to go into the medical system and it's for good reason. In this country, you know, we waste a lot of time in the medical system and we really over medicalize a lot of simple issues that could be fixed with diet and exercise, to be honest with you. So again, it's this balance of, you know, if someone has something like, you know, high blood pressure, and it's at a level where they are at an increased risk of heart attack and stroke, I'm not in my scope of practice gonna diagnose that, but a medical doctor might be like, hey, you need to go on medication for this. But I think the part that's lacking is the second part, the and. You need to go on this medication and you need to work out and eat healthier. And I'm going to send you to a nutritionist who can help you with that. A lot of times, you know, I, I definitely hear a lot of clients complaining about experiences they've had where people have been told just to diet and exercise and they're like, what does that even mean? So I've personally been put through that as well. Um, I do have a larger body frame. That's just genetically how I was built. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm actually very proud of this body that I carry, but I'm often, you know, if I have anything wrong with me, that's the first thing that comes up in any medical situation. Well, your BMI is this or, you know, that kind of that kind of thing. And I'm not saying that I should just continue and continue to let my weight be overweight my whole life. I definitely do keep an eye on it. I eat very healthy. I work out four or five days a week. But at the same time, if you're going to bring up those types of things with your clients or patients, you need to have access and give them access to somebody who can actually be a specialist in that area. So if we think about the solution between are we just holistic, are we just evidence-based, I think really the solution is balance. Not just saying, okay, I'm going to gear myself completely away from the medical system and just take supplements that I found on Amazon, which by the way, supplements are medications just in a different sense um or say that i'm just completely going to ignore 
supplements. I'm going to ignore diet and exercise being the foundation or the pillar of my health and just do all these medications. I'm sure you've heard of maybe a relative who just says, I don't need to eat healthy with my diabetes because I take my medicine in the morning. That's complete bullshit. And I'm calling y'all out with love. So again, this balanced approach between embracing the alternative, embracing the holistic um, sense, and really coming to the root of what's going on with ourselves. Because if we're just gonna continue and continue to mask symptoms with medication, then we're not truly gonna get to the root of what's going on with us. This can pertain to low back pain, this can pertain to high blood pressure, this can pertain to depression and anxiety as well. So if we truly think about a holistic healthcare provider, this person does not necessarily need to exist outside of the medical system. This can be that same primary care doctor, but maybe instead of just making assumptions or just throwing blanket statements out about being quote unquote um, healthier, maybe we actually guard ourselves with this team, this army of people who we know actually can get that client to where they need. So my suggestion with the medical system, but also with you as someone who's consuming the medical system in this country, is having a team, having a team-based approach. Have a physical therapist who can help you if you're having pain um, with getting back to exercise. Have, have a primary care who understands and knows that you're gonna need referrals for specialists. Have a nutritionist who can help you get started on a plan. You know, have a community, have a community of people who are gonna support and nourish your needs on a emotional standpoint, but also on a wellness standpoint. This can look like a friend who wants to go on a walk with you, but it can also be someone, you know, a friend you laugh with or a friend you go and drink tea with and just sit and have company with. I think a lot of things in this country are lifestyle diseases. And really, what do we need to do with lifestyle diseases? We need to approach it from all different angles. Not just the you need to lose weight angle, not just the you need to exercise more angle, and not just the medication angle. We need to consider as well that there's a human sitting behind that illness or that diagnosis who really is needing help emotionally, mentally, physically, and educationally. We need to educate our clients and really you need to find providers that are willing to take the time to educate you on whatever you're dealing with. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. If you have any comments, please leave them below. Um, and until we see you again, peace out.